The Triplets of Belleville is a French animated film that tells the story of a sweet old lady whose grandson is a competitive cyclist who gets abducted by the French mafia and shipped to New York for nefarious reasons. And her, his grandmother, along with their overweight family dog Bruno, uh, get on an adventure to get the grandchild back. And along the way, they come across uh, the Triplets of Belleville, an old New York musical act who are now old ladies themselves, and together they help each other out to rescue the grandchild. And what I really love about this movie and why it's among my 20 favorite films is mostly having to do with the animation style. The animation style of this movie is just precious, it's imaginative, and it's different, it's, it's very French, <laughs> especially, and it, it's like... The uh, the film is pretty much completely done in pantomime. It's completely almost a silent film, uh, apart from some offhand uh, French lines here and there that aren't really imp important. S stuff like what's in the TV in the background or somebody saying, Oui, monsieur, or something like that, you know? And I very much recommend this movie based only on the style and the kind of um, innocence of this kind of adventure that that a grandmother goes on to save her beloved grandchild. Nightcrawler is a thriller and a social satire and a sort of crooked from rags to riches story that follows a charlatan, a street hustler, who gets employed in the field of gathering uh, video footage for early morning news broadcasts. So basically he uh, listens to police radios and gets to crime scenes before the police to film the scene on video and then sells it on the uh, to the uh, news networks. And... I really love this movie for two reasons. One of them is Jake Gyllenhaal's performance, which is unbelievable. This is his greatest performance I've ever seen. Him, him portraying this uh, kind of a sociopath character that follows very closely all these sort of uh, uh, self-help book kind of archetypal uh, kind of motivational uh, kind of builds, but is... A crooked character in a crooked field. And the second reason is it's social satire of this uh, commercialization of misery through news media and this kind of manipulation of news media and the truth through the news media uh, to basically sell stories to consumers, to the viewers. And it's uh, it's kind of a go blows it a little bit overboard from what it really is, but it sends a very effective message of uh, how how uh, ma manipulatable the viewing audience is to when they when they're given things they want to hear rather than what's the truth and the lengths people who are willing to do a lot of crooked things to make money and gain power and influence are willing to go to manipulate that truth and feed it like slop to a bunch of pigs watching the TV. <laughs> you know? And uh, yeah, I love this movie. It had a great impact on me and it, the per main character's performance is fantastic. Faust is a classical tale of a man making a deal with the devil to trade his soul for a bunch of superpowers for benevolent reasons, but not realizing the sort of angst and terror that comes with such a deal. And this is a silent film, it's from F.W. Murnau from the 20s, and the reason I really love this is because when I got introduced to a lot of silent movie classics, this stood out, not only because at this time in history, German Germany was really experimenting with a lot of like uh, cinematic uh, techniques and special effects that really like stand out like this and Metropolis and others like that really have some incredible visual effects going for them for the time that even to this day like make me think like how did they pull that off is that a miniature or not what's going on you know and it's really intriguing and this is really like a gothic fantasy from the medieval era and also this is 
a, um, a movie that has a message that really resonates with me. I've even gotten this cover art as a tattoo on my shoulder because of how, uh, how much it had an effect on me. It's, it's, it's a story about kind of uh, realizing the sense of worth one's humanity holds and not to trade that for anything and realizing uh, even for benevolent acts, you know, one's soul is one's soul and all that. The performances are a lot of fun. There is a little bit of a lull in the middle where there's a lot of co comedy uh, along with all the misery and all that, but... I guess because the misery is so miserable at times, one needs that sort of levity to counterbalance that, to make the uh, depressing parts more effective. But this is one of those films. If you're ever interested in looking up a silent film, this is my recommendation. Faust. <laughs> Vampire Hunter D. Bloodlust is a Japanese animation action-adventure film, a uh, fantasy film, a kind of Castlevania-style Transylvania fantasy film that tells the story of a half-human, half-vampire vampire hunter who goes on a quest to rescue a nobleman's daughter who's been kidnapped by a vampire. And the reason I love this movie is because of the animation style and the action. It's really top-notch and I love it. Very detailed style animation animation and drawing style and lots of cool just mixtures of Wild West science fiction, fantasy, monsters and all that stuff. A lot of like uh, firearms and uh, cyborg horses and sword play and monsters of all shapes and sizes, you know. Good stuff, good stuff. The story is not anything too like fa fantastic in the sense of the story being the selling point. To me, it's the action, the, the visual style and uh, I, like, I like the soundtrack quite Quite a bit. Whenever I listen to the soundtrack, it gives me goosebumps, and I just really enjoy this one. And it's one of those where uh, I I first saw it as a teenager, and uh, a lot of movies that I loved as a teenager, especially anime films, have kind of not aged that well when I've watched them as an adult. But this one is great, and especially as an adult when I saw the Japanese original. Uh, dialogue version of this. It really blew me away. This is fantastic. I love it. This version that I'm holding in my hand only has the English version, and sadly I've only been managed to uh, find the English version on my, you know, region coding area. So that sucks, but thankfully there's the internet. So yeah, if you're gonna watch this, please watch it in Japanese. It's fantastic. Good stuff. <laughs> Alejandro Jodorowsky's The Holy Mountain is a surrealist film that tells the story of a thief who becomes an apprentice of an alchemist who then takes him and the rest of his acolytes on a quest to find the holy mountain to attain immortality. But this movie is really, because it's a surrealist film, that kind of plot description is really unnecessary and not important. It's really mostly all about playing on visuals and metaphors. It's a very visually heavy film and a very kind of grotesque film, and that's why it's not <laughs> recommended for uh, the ages under 18 right there on the cover. And uh, the, the kind of thing that this film is going for is kind of taking a look, putting under a microscope a lot of norms and societal, cultural aspects we take for granted uh, and it questions a lot of like uh, traditions and authority figures and a lot of acceptable violence and cruelty and all those kinds of things and depicts them in kind of a gr as, as in a um, in a deconstructive and grotesque manner. And the movie kind of starts off kind of selling itself almost as this kind of a new age guru type of type of shit that I despise, but by the end, without spoiling anything, it really isn't that, and that's what sold me on it after first time viewing it. And the reason it's in my favorite films is because when I first saw it, I had never seen anything like it. I had seen surrealist films before. I liked films like Eraserhead and others like that. But this was something different. Maybe because it uh, gave me expectations that were shattered by the end of the film. And maybe it's because of just the style of Alejandro Jodorowsky that really sold me on it. Whatever the case, 
the holy mountain is the holy mountain. <laughs> what can I say? It can't be compared to anything else. I like this. I like this shit a lot. Check it out if your stomach can take it. Dark City is a science fiction neo-noir film that tells the story of a man waking up with amnesia and a murdered body in his hotel room. And he runs through the city streets, haunted by the police, his psychiatrist, and strange pale strangers. And the less I say about all that, the better, because this is a mystery plot. The reason I really like this movie is... Well, it's visual style again. <laughs> it's it's one of those things where I guess because movies are a visual medium, the visual style really resonates with me whenever a movie has an interesting one. And this movie is very much a uh, story about identity, the idea of identity, this kind of uh, are you the summation of your parts, kind of what makes you, you, is it all your life experiences and the things your parents taught you, what you learned in school and all these different things, are those all together combined what makes you, you, and you know, using the metaphoric human soul, you know, is that what makes you know, a human soul or something like that. Uh, this movie is uh, very similar to The Matrix in a lot of ways. This came out one year before The Matrix, and I would uh, actually hazard to guess if you saw this and Blade before you saw The Matrix, you would think that that was a complete, like, uh, you know, <laughs> hack job, that movie. But still, it's very much this sense of identity, this sense of living a lie, this sense of uh, these strangers haunting after you with ulterior motives, and this science fiction world where you feel like a rat in a maze, like a laboratory experiment for somebody else to poke at your brain and your conscience. But yeah, I really love this movie, and if you're into this sort of neo-noir, mystery, science fiction stuff, I really recommend this, and I really love how the strangers pretty much look like the classic Nosferatu. <laughs> I love that stuff. Great, great things, and it really, again, like... Get, like, it really gives me goosebumps whenever I watch it. I love this movie. Nicholas Winding Refn's Drive is a crime thriller that tells the story of a getaway driver who falls in love with his neighbor and who does a gig for his neighbor's husband to get some mafiosos off of his back that are giving him, you know, a kind of hard time. And the mafiosos wind up screwing the getaway driver on this gig and all sorts of trouble ensues. Now, this movie, I love, love, love it because it really, like, again, shattered expectations. This movie was marketed very much as a sort of Fast and Furious car action movie, but what it wound up actually being is much more of a romance film. Film. And again, very minimal dialogue, visual heavy uh, uh, romance film that just kind of happens to take place during this kind of getaway scenario, you know? It's, it's, uh, the ca main character is the, the perfect portrayal of an introvert who uh, does most of the romance and, uh, and uh, kind of uh, social uh, relationship stuff through, uh, like, body language, eye contact, and anything but dialogue. I think too many times, uh, especially in American films and Hollywood films, dialogue is the be-all, end-all that drives drama and drives story and drives character development forward, and this was a welcome uh, breath of fresh air to see it done mostly through visuals and giving the characters time to really let those visuals sink in. Like, I can imagine a lot of scenes where, like, uh, like a producer or somebody would be like, Cut! Cut! Cut already! But no, you let the scenes and you let the eye contact and you let all that sink in and it's really great. I love, love, love this movie really much and I recommend it to anybody who's really into good drama, good character development and good style. The visual style isn't like overwhelming but my god could you like take screenshots of every frame of this movie and frame them on your wall. It's just a beautiful movie to look at and... A lot of fun.
Dread is a science fiction action film that takes place in a dystopian future where law and order is upheld by the judges, the special forces that have the authority of uh, martial law, basically, that can lay judgments right there in the field. And this movie tells the story of a judge and a rookie that's under his protection, uh, answering a call from a neighborhood where they actually get locked down by the leading gang running that neighborhood and who have to fight their way out of it. And this is a lot of fun. This is so over-the-top macho bullshit, kind of. <laughs> you know, it, it reminds me of a lot of cool action movies from my youth, like the Robocop and such, where there's ultra-violence, there's like unapologetically uh, macho, like one-liners and uh, and uh, action stars that have like that that type of chin, that kind of frown, that kind of voice. You know what I'm talking about. The dread type of voice, chin and tone, you know. And it's a a lot of fun. It's a great movie. It follows a very simple uh, story of uh, characters finding their fighting their way out of an enclosed area, and uh, it has this. Um uh, great way of uh, introducing this science fiction world to you without giving like an info dump of just like let's show you everything of how politics work let's show you how the social aspects of this uh, setting work instead it brings you to basically a poor neighborhood and through the action itself you get introduced to just about every uh, interesting and worthwhile point about the setting and it's you know a dystopian setting so again it has some things to say about uh, authority figures and you know violence and uh, and kind of you know, certain fascist elements that go around in there. There's a reason why I compared it to RoboCop, and I'm sure if you like RoboCop, you'll love this. This is just, this is one of the greatest action movies to come out of the 2010s. And when people are like, look back and complain that, oh, they don't make movies like they used to, like every great movie is coming from like, uh, 90 something, 80 something, 70 something. Bullshit! Dread came out in the 2010s and it's fucking awesome check it out Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange is a unique drama film that follows the story of Alex, a juvenile delinquent and a leader of a gang that takes immense sadistic pleasure in beating, torturing, and raping just about anybody they come across. Once Alex finally gets imprisoned, he finds out about a new treatment that makes sure you never get imprisoned again. Little does he know that it also mangles your brain to the point where you're unable to commit any kind of crime ever again. And this movie, I really love it, and it's one of those unique kind of movies that I saw first as a teenager that kind of took me aback, like I'd never seen anything like it once again. It's it's uh, it's style of dialogue and the visual style of uh, the setting that it takes place in. It's an, It takes place in an undefined near future with strange architecture, strange style of clothing, and strange uh, synth synthesizer classical music, and the, the street lingo that the characters use is also very unique, to say the least. I've also read the book, but the book pales in comparison to this movie only because it has one final chapter that ruins it all, whereas this movie leaves that one final chapter out. Thankfully. But the reason why I really love this movie as well is because of its message, because of what it's really going for. And what it's going for is this kind of sense of choice, this kind of moral burden of uh, doing evil acts out of your own free will. You choose to do evil acts for the pleasure sake of doing evil, or you do good acts for the goodness sake of it because you made that cognitive choice in this movie the main character is full-on evil sadistic uh, completely like malevolent kind of a demon of a human being but after he gets his brain mangled with with the Ludovico treatment uh, he is no longer able to work on those violent and horrible impulses, instead he becomes completely pacified. The problem is that 
people are not black and white, they're gradients of gray, so when somebody is completely pacified and completely helpless, he becomes a victim of everybody else's darker impulses on, on the flip side of that. And uh, it's really a kind of a um, meditation on this sort of, is it better to do evil acts when they're like sincerely evil of your own free choice, or is it better to do good acts when they're against your own free will. Of course, the society at large wants its citizens to be, you know, good and unharmful, and that's what everybody would want out of their fellow neighbor, you know? But then again, it's one of those things where does free will have any sort of value when it can just be treated out of you? And this movie, seeing it again as an adult, I got a lot of the themes when I was a teenager, but there's also a lot of themes that were kind of, kind of flew past my head when I was a teenager that I now get, especially about the new minister of the interior and when he goes to the prison and talks out loud, you know, with the prison, uh, prison, uh, uh, wardens and the people of that sort about his plans to fill the prisons with political, <laughs> political prisoners and stuff like that. There's a lot of things I originally missed that I now love seeing when I rewatch this. It has a lot of rewatch value. It has a lot of value as an artistic work. I really like this movie. Check it out. Nicholas Winding Refn's Only God Forgives is a sort of surrealist crime thriller that follows the story of Julian, who's a drug runner whose brother gets killed in an incident that involves a police officer. Julian's mother is completely convinced that the cop is the culprit and the killer of uh, Julian's brother and demands Julian get righteous vengeance on his brother by killing the cop. On that path, however, Julian discovers things about himself as well as about the cop that change things out quite a bit. Now, this movie, it split general audiences in half quite a bit, and judging from all the people I've shown this movie to, they've also been kind of split 50-50. People either hate this movie or love it. I happen to love it. Uh, the reason is that this came after Drive, and Drive blew a lot of people away, and this movie was marketed as a straight-up Thailand, Thai boxing kind of centered crime thriller type of movie, but what it actually wound up being was the, the director's kind of surrealist passion project that deals with all sorts of issues having to do with masculinity, with violence, with uh, with uh, the main character's kind of Oedipus complex with his mother, uh, this kind of um, sense of kind of robbed masculinity or perverted masculinity, where the the main character uh, kind of focuses a lot on his hands. Through this metaphor of male hands, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of sensitivity and love and care gets perverted into a clinched fist of violence and horror. And the movie deals a lot with the main character's uh, conscience and, uh, and uh, his uh, sense of guilt over this life of violence that's been uh, informed and, uh, and, uh, and manipulated by his horrible mother, and uh, the way it's kind of portrayed in this movie is that he attempts to fight God himself. God is represented by the police officer who he is after in this film, and him trying desperately to stay in a state of denial about himself, he actually fights God rather than faces his own guilt and gives his hands up for the God to cut off for his misdeeds and his sins. I really love that kind of stuff in this film. And again, just like with Drive, you could take a still shot of every frame in this movie and frame them on your wall. This is a beautifully shot film. It has a great soundtrack by Cliff Martinez. I really love the use of, uh, of Ryan Gosling in this, just as in Drive, as someone with minimal dialogue and more just long stares and uh, body language and all that. The main character in this movie is more of an avatar for the themes that it d dives into rather than the actual character story that it takes 
<laughs> that the movie takes on, but I don't care. I love it. It's just too bad a lot of people hate it, but that hasn't stopped the director thus far, and I hope it won't stop him in the future. Keep it up, Nicholas Winding Refn. This movie is awesome. The Match Factory Girl is a Finnish drama film that tells the sad story of a young woman working in a match factory who dreams and fantasizes about love and romance, but whose actual family life is terrible and tearing her apart. And I love this movie. I really, really love this movie for the reasons that it pulls on my heartstrings like a son of a bitch. It's not that sort of Lars von Trier kind of uh, uh, sadistic kind of misery porn that his movies often are when it comes to feeling sympathy for your main character, but you still feel a ton of sympathy for this main character. She is so innocent, she is so adorable and cute, and she just wants to carve out her piece of love and happiness out of the world, a world that just shits on her and is filled with nothing but miserable pricks who want to take advantage of her. And it's one of those films where it's 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 again minimal dialogue and maximum atmosphere there's so much time giving to each shot there's so much atmosphere just her working in the match factory really relates to the daily grind of her life without a word said and uh, every piece of her dreaming about a better life, her dreaming about said romance, and then wallowing in the kind of misfortune that her attempts kind of uh, wind up becoming. It's it's really, it really carves sympathy out of your heart like a son of a bitch, and it's the good kind, it's not the bad kind, it's not being sadistic about it. I love this movie, check it out, Match Factory Girl. Alejandro Jodorowsky's The Dance of Reality is one of my favorite films, and it goes even above the holy mountain, because this has much more of a narrative structure. This is much more personal in, in a lot of ways. This is an autobiographical film. This is very much a film about Alejandro Jodorowsky looking back at his own upbringing. The story that is told is the story of his own childhood and the story of his father's life during during his childhood. The first half of the movie focuses more on his childhood and the second half of the film focuses more on his father. And this is again a surrealist film, but it's a surrealist film where his life lessons, his life experiences, the people he's run into, his relationship to his mother, his relationship to his father, his relationship to his uh, 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 friends and uh, everybody around him, really, that's where the visual metaphors, again, come into play the way they did in The Holy Mountain, though not in as much of a grotesque way as in The Holy Mountain. Well, I kind of lie, there is a moment where a man gets pissed on, but still, <laughs> you know, this is beautiful. This is a legitimate work of art, and I legitimately empathize with both Alejandro himself and his father, even though the father is depicted as kind of a heinous human being, but he's a relatable and understandable and a sympathetic piece of shit a lot of times. But the thing is that... There's this interesting part where uh, Jodorowsky's own oldest son plays Jodorowsky's own father in this. So there's a little bit of a that kind of a <laughs> Freudian thing going on. And in the sequel to this, which is called Endless Poetry, that was not quite as good, but still was great, his youngest son plays him as a youth. So there's the circle complete. But yeah, the, this movie, it's precious, it's beautiful, it... It has a lot of things that have a lot of weight to them. It, it covers a lot of grounds and it depicts a lot of really important like moments of growth in a child's life in a very interesting way with visuals the way Jodorowsky does with his films. And I love it for it. I relate it to a lot of it. And I can't wait to see more once the third movie comes out. I don't know what it's going to be called, but once it comes out, I'll be ready. <laughs> So yeah, check it out, The Dance of Reality.
Spike Jones's Her is a romance film set in the near future where a man still feeling the effects of a bitter divorce and heartache from a past relationship gets himself a uh, new operating system for his computer and smartphone and the operating system is equipped with an AI and the AI is so sophisticated that they form an actual human relationship that turns into a romantic relationship and that's the story of this film. It's the story of their romance, you know, and uh, I love this film and it's one of my favorites not only because I love the uh, performance of Joaquin Phoenix in this who is pretty much my favorite male actor working today it's not only because the world building, the dialogue, the characters, everything is top-notch, it's so great the reason why it really rings true to me and therefore makes it one of my favorites is because it's so relatable. The message of the movie, at least the way I interpret it, is very relatable. The main character, when he boots the artificial intelligence for the first time, it asks him and probes him on a lot of personal questions about how his relationship to his mother is, what his temperament is like, what his wants and needs and all these different things are like, and it forms its own personality around that, to cater to that. And I'm sure a lot of people have gone through something where they feel kind of uh, uh, underappreciated or, 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 or uh, not getting enough attention or people not really understanding your pain and your kind of anguish and your life and all this sort of stuff. And the thing is that real relationship, what, real relationships, whether they're romantic or friendships, family relationships or whatnot, they include two complete humans, not a human and a person that's made to cater to you. And that's what this film really spoke to me on, on that level, that of course the main character falls in love with an AI that's made to cater to his wants and needs and his ego. Real relationships include conflict. Real relationships include risk. Real relationships include compromise. This movie very nicely dives into this safe relationship kind of thing where you can have a relationship with an artificial intelligence and uh, you know that it's all about you. Basically, without spoiling anything about this film, I first fell in love with the relationships the characters were having because of its kind of innocence and, oh, I love, I love, I love a lot of artificial intelligence android science fiction stories about how artificial intelligence isn't that different from ours, but the way this movie uses it, it's artificial intelligence made to fit to you. It's like a commentary on, like, um, Tinder dating or something like that, you know, it's very interesting and and uh, it really spoke to me. I love it. Please check it out. Mad Max Fury Road is a post-apocalyptic action movie that tells the story of a general to a ruthless warlord who has a change of heart and decides to escape her service, and along the way she captures the warlord's most favorite slave girls, and the warlord gives chase. And that's this movie, one long, glorious chase through the desert. This movie. I mean, oh my god, how much I love this movie. It's my favorite action movie pretty much of all time, and it came out in the 2010s, so suck it, you know, <laughs> like everybody's stuck in the past, you know, this is awesome, awesome stuff. I mean, it's not only the superficial, like, um, cool action stuff, the stunts, the world building, and, and characters, and the design of all the clothes, and, and uh, everything like that. There's a lot of underlying themes going on in the movie that keeps your brain working. It's not just stimulating your eyes, it's also stimulating your brain to where, where you uh, are given these scenarios in this kind of future setting where it 
dives into the dynamics between the powerful and the powerless, the rich and the poor, the, uh, those with political influence and those with none, those who are uh, like gladly uh, giving themselves up to somebody else's co uh, cause and to serve someone else's pr purpose, like the dynamics between men and women, the dynamics between uh, the, uh, the earth and those with too much greed to go around, you know. It's it's fantastic. I, I mean, I can't just praise it enough. It's being a, being a Warhammer 40k fan, you know, there there's never going to be a movie that comes closer to the space orc di uh, like aesthetic than this movie. If everybody had green skin in this movie, it would be perfect. Like <laughs> that's the, like all the cool over the top macho bullshit in this movie. All that kind of Valhalla, you will be reborn shiny and chrome witness, you know, mediocre. All those all those things it's just too good this like if you have not seen this and you like action you're doing yourself a disservice this is one of those what are you thinking go out and watch it this is the only movie i've ever gone to the theater to watch multiple times it's fucking beautiful <laughs> The Warriors is a super campy adventure film that tells the story of the Warriors, a street gang that goes into a gang meetup where a supposed coronation of the biggest boss of all the gangs is supposed to take place. They get framed as a, the murderers of that said boss and all the other gangs uh, start to give them chase as they try to escape and get back to their own gang turf. And this movie, it's like, it's a classic, it's a cult uh, favorite of a lot of people, including myself, but I only saw it a few years ago. It's less than 10 years ago that I first saw this, and immediately I fell in love with it. It kind of bypassed reality in the sense that it became almost like uh, that kind of nostalgia love movie without it actually being a part of my youth and childhood. It's it's like there's a certain aesthetic about it. There's a certain style about the dialogue, the way it, things look, the music, all the other gangs and everything where it feels like this is so close to home that it, it's it, exactly as if I grew up with this. It, it felt familiar. It's like it, when you meet somebody and you immediately click, it's like a brother from another mother. This movie is a nostalgia, <laughs> a nostalgic movie for me, even though it's not from another mother or something like that. Whatever. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. It's fun. It's 79 was the year this came out and it really like, uh, uh, you can feel it through the screen. It's based on a book that that's much more of a kind of dark and gritty and kind of something that has a lot of societal commentary to it and all that sort of thing. But this movie, this is just campy goodness. Like, uh, yeah, this is like, grab a bunch of beers with your friends, watch this, you'll laugh and you'll smile and you'll have a good time. It's great. It's It's a lot of fun. I just... It's so, it's just precious. I love the Warriors. The Man Without a Past is a Finnish humanistic drama film that tells the story of a worker arriving in Helsinki at night only to get mugged by street hooligans and getting all his possessions, including his ID, stolen. The next morning he wakes up with amnesia from all the head trauma and with none of the local uh, agencies being able to help him without his memories or his ID, he basically becomes a hobo. He becomes one of the uh, hobo community in the docks and... Uh, the movie chronicles his story as he's trying to build himself back up from the hobo dom that he is kind of forced into, falling in love with a uh, Salvation Army worker and everything in between. This is a humanistic movie. It's something that really warms my heart. A lot of times I really enjoy the sort of uh, s movies that have cynical messages about, you know, mankind and the world and, uh, and the selfish, cruel nature of human beings. And this movie has a lot of characters who are selfish and cruel, but... 
the sort of the sort of hope movies that give you hope for humanity give movies that remind you of people doing good things for goodness sake those things kind of warm my heart really and a lot of movies i really love have that sort of message it's either something about discovering the kind of positive nature of the human spirit or just this kind of uh, helping your fellow man in need kind of thing such as this movie it's it's again just like the match factory girl that that's from the same director as this it it doesn't go into the sadistic realm of uh, like forcing tears out of you because of its sympathetic character in uh, in, in harsh situations but every time I watch this, there's a certain scene. It's not like a especially cruel scene. On the contrary, it's so heartwarming that I cry every time if I've watched the movie from the beginning to that point. It's This movie, again, is precious. This is something I love because it's something that reaffirms like my uh my um my love for humanity <laughs> that sort of thing it's it's something i like to watch much like i love to watch star trek especially the next generation because it reaffirms to have like hope for better humanity it's easy to get hung up on the negative stuff and become cynical and become you know completely bogged down by it and every now and again, even if it's a fantasy, a fiction, you know, you need to give your heart, you know, a break and have hope and positivity. I love this movie. I love its soundtrack. I love its style. I like its, I love its dry humor and I love its uniqueness and humanity and heart. This has bucket loads of heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's RoboCop. Everybody knows RoboCop, but still, yeah, it's a science fiction social commentary action movie that tells the story of Alex Murphy, a regular cop who is shot by a gang and turned into a robot. RoboCop, a product owned and produced by Omni Consumer Products. And this is one of those movies that, much like other one another um, Paul Verhoeven and Ed Newmeyer film, Starship Troop, is something that uh, suffers from people seeing them as kids and not re-watching them as adults or teenagers where they just remember the action a part of it and in Starship Troopers case maybe also the tits but you know uh, watching this as an adult and already you know when I was a teenager I was getting to kind of notice certain things about this that it's just not just a kind of superhero robot movie but also it has a lot of commentary on the kind of uh, 80s Reaganomics, the kind of uh, corporate greed kind of uh, blown overboard in this uh, movie setting where just about everything is viable to be uh, privatized, co uh, uh, commercialized, and corporatized, where even the police are no longer on the uh, public sector but on the private sector. And... Uh, Taking someone like Alex Murphy, a regular blue-collar worker, a cop, and turning him into a soulless product for profit's sake, you know, is, is, is like, really, like, uh, pushes that pushes that commentary through, but even though, even then his human spirit kind of penetrates through this facade of uh, becoming a commercial product, and he is kind of truly rejuvenated through uh, his soul kind of uh, coming through the middle, and... Um, and I just love this movie. I've, I've said the word love so many times today. I think my, my brain is starting to melt already. But I love the movie for its humanity's sake. Again, it's not just an action movie and social commentary movie and all that. But what I love are the human moments. The moments when Robocop goes to his uh, old home and uh, has all these flashbacks. And all those kind of moments. The moments when after he He's taken his helmet off. He no longer has the burp, 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 kind of robotic kind of tone to his voice. And there's all sorts of uh, levels of melancholy and 
the special effects, the stop motion animations on Ed 209, the squib eg- explosions from all the gunshot wounds. It's ugh, so good. And it has the greatest movie villain of all times, Clarence Bodiger. You know, bitches leave and all that good stuff. It's mm, Robocop. Can it get any better than this? It's only number four, so it has to. <laughs> Tangerines is an Estonian humanistic drama film that tells the story of two old tangerine farmers in a small village that everyone else has evacuated due to a growing conflict right around the village. One day, these men discover two wounded soldiers, one from each side of the conflict, and they bring them up to their homes and nurse them back to health, no matter how much the two men hate one another. And this is one of those humanistic uh, films that not only warms my heart due to its positive message and hope for humankind and all that jazz, the thing is that, well, besides Captain Picard, the main character of this movie, Ebo, the man on the cover, is my kind of, uh, when it comes to fictional characters, I wish I could be like, Ebo is right up there with uh, Captain Picard. We Nobody knows how they will act in extreme situations in real life. It's so easy to imagine, like, if you saw two opposing sides having, like, w- wounded soldiers outside your door, that you would just lock the doors and close the curtains and, I don't want to get involved, you know, that sort of, uh, like, self-preservation type of thing, which is completely natural and hum- hu- uh, human-like, <laughs> you know, uh, but the kind of things that Evil and his uh, friend do in the movie to help these two soldiers, putting themselves, you know, in, in danger by doing so purely out of uh, love for your fellow man and in this kind of uh, this kind of moral duty of that's just what you do kind of thing. Don't need to question it any further. It, it's just, it's so admirable. It's just so honorable. It's just something where... I, I just, you know, it, another movie that makes me cry my eyes out, and not because of tragedy, but because of the, 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 the kind of love for your fellow man. It's whew, these movies, man. These movies, they, they need to exist, and I'm so glad this one does. Please check it out. It's, it has to have flown uh, under a lot of people's radars due to its country of origin, uh, but. Please check it out. It, and the, the, the other little trivia thing is that right around the time this came out, also another movie called Tangerine came out, which deals with a completely different subject matter, even though that's humanistic as well. But still, <laughs> it's something about tangerines, the soys of a tangerine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hell yes, yes, yes. Calamari Union is my second favorite movie of all time. And I know a lot of my Finnish viewers will be rolling their eyes in their heads perhaps by now, but fuck it, I love this movie. This is a quirky Finnish comedy that tells the story of a group of hobos who are all wearing Ray-Ban sunglasses and trench coats and are all named Frank. Except for one guy who's who has a Finnish name, but is the only character who speaks English. <laughs> but this story tells of their epic journey, this odyssey from one side of Helsinki to the other. It always strikes as absurdist humor because it doesn't make any sense. You know, it's just it's just portrayed in a way where you believe it and you buy it, and it's awesome. I love this movie. It's just it fe- has the feel of a bunch of guys getting together and like. Let's make a movie. And this is what they came up with. It's perfect. Things just come out of the, uh, uh, like, uh, out of, behind a corner that you're not expecting. There's so much dry humor. Everybody fucking dies one way or another in the movie or fails miserably in other ways. Half of the cast are musicians uh, from uh, certain uh, levels of fame to another, but mostly rock and roll musicians from uh, of the Finnish variety. And it's it's I just love I just love it to pieces. Like this is again so fucking precious. Get your hands on Kalamari Union, and if you're Finnish, if you haven't seen this, what the fuck are you doing? Do it. 
do it. Just watch this movie. Just watch it. You guys saw it coming. Conan the Barbarian is my favorite movie of all time. It's not the best movie of all time, but it's my personal favorite movie of all time. It's a fantasy adventure action film that tells the story of Conan the Barbarian on a quest to get revenge on the evil wizard Thalsa Doom for massacring his home village when he was but a child. And yeah, what can I say about this movie that I haven't already said on my channel? There's like an hour and a half or an even more, you know, of me rambling about different aspects about Conan and how much I love him and how much there's a little trivia here and trivia there and reminds me of this and reminds me of that. If you're interested in me going in length about Conan, check that out. But yeah, when it comes to nostalgia, I try not to let nostalgia affect me too much when I'm thinking about my favorites, but how could you not when it's your all-time favorite? I saw this movie when I was like 13, and ever since then it's had an influence on me. Every bit of story writing I do, every bit of role-playing uh, quest uh, writing I do, every bit of, uh, uh, of, of any kind of creative endeavor, I tend to listen to the Conan the Barbarian soundtrack that I love, I tend to think of the aesthetics of different designs in Conan, I know every goddamn line by heart from Conan, it's, I, oh, what can I say? There is no other movie that has the impact on, an imprint on my brain that Conan does. I think there's like a ridge on my brain that has the carvings of one of these swords or something. It's like, it's there. It's there to stay. If, if I ever get riddled with dementia and Alzheimer's and everything like that, I'll still know every goddamn Conan line by heart. That's how deeply ingrained it is, and I love it. It's my number one favorite. Thanks for sticking by this video all the way, and yeah, have a good day.